how do you think about animals? Like what, what's driving this inquiry in terms of their, their emotional and their cognitive life? First of all, I think that we humans are also an animal species and that we, we, I, we, we tend to sort of put ourselves on a pedestal and thinking that we, we are one and then animals are like this, this, the other, uh, as if it were uh, homogeneous, which is really isn't. So, so each animal species have their own adapt. We have our own adaptations and each animal, all the other animal species that we surround ourselves will, with do as well. So, um, I don't know if that really answers your question, but, uh, I tend to, so the work I do is to sort of try to help animals live better lives with humans. And that very often starts with understanding how that animal species would live in the wild and the type of, of life that they have, whether they're a predator, whether they're a prey animal species, uh, how they process the world, the, the type of information that they take in. Um, so for instance, we might see a dog who's wagging his tail. And we might think that it's only happy dogs that wag their tails, but actually tail wagging is seen in many different contexts. Uh, and we might think of it as a visual communication thing, but actually it could be that they're dispersing scent. That The tail wag will sort of, that scent will waft over to you so you can uh, take in information about my current emotional state. They definitely have scent glands back there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So can we interpret dog wags of different types? Is, yeah. there, is there a way so, to do that? So one very interesting thing is that the dog wagging with a predominant left wag. Left tends, for the dog? Left for the dog. So he's mm -hmm. wagging on the left-hand side of his body, mm -hmm. tends to be associated with negative emotional states. And on the right tends to be associated with positive emotional states. Uh, and, and the same, cats tend to look at the world from the, the left when in a negative emotional state so, and from the right when in a positive emotional state. So uh, looking from the left, meaning the left eye slightly forward, yeah. um, the so, head tilted, so, taking, so the so right eye. So taking in that information with this eye. So, okay. If so you're so scary, the, Some people are just you. listening. They're not watching, okay. so they can't <laughs> see this. So what, um, what Carolina is describing is if the, the head is turned slightly to the side, so the left eye is forward. Yeah. That's a, um, so they're a looking at the stimulus mm -hmm. with their left eye mm -hmm. if that stimulus is fear-inducing. And and the opposite to the right-hand yeah. side if it's um, more yeah. attractive to them. Or, yeah, uh, so this is lateralized. Interesting. And then the tail wag, you said a dog wagging on the left-hand side, more negative yeah. right-hand side, yeah. and more positive. What about uh, full sweeps? Yeah, full sweeps. Um, and I, I don't know the details here, but certainly the type of tail wag, whether it's sort of very low and fast or whether it's high and, and sort of stiff, will communicate different emotional states. Do you think that over time we learn these signals without realizing that we learn these signals? Yes, absolutely. Because we associate it with our dog being in a particular yeah. circumstance or behaving yeah. in a certain way. So studies have shown that, that we humans are actually, um, we learn to read dogs by exposure, even passive exposure, just be living in an environment. And apparently it's, it's, if we live in a culture where dogs live close with humans, we get better in reading dogs and then in cultures where dogs don't interact that much with humans. Um, so there's that. And there's also this the issue that we are typically better at reading gross body language than we are at reading facial expressions. Apparently, one of the reasons being that dogs move different facial muscles when they make emotional facial expressions. They move different muscles than what humans do. What can you tell us about the facial expressions of dogs? Well, there's been some studies in the last couple of years that have looked at which muscles are moving mm -hmm. when, in, in which contexts. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, so they'll, they'll expose the dog to different types of stimuli and they'll look at, they'll film the dog and look at what, what muscles are twitching, where, where is, where is the face moving in response to these stimuli? So those types of, of studies have found that, that, you know, when you, when a dog is exposed to, let's say, thunder or fireworks sounds, they will show a, a certain facial configuration when 
uh, their owner returns home after not being seen for several hours, they will show a different facial co configuration and so on. So it, it seems that they do show facial expressions. It's just that some of those facial expressions are, the, it's not the same muscles that we show in the corresponding emotional state. So that would, I think, bias us to misreading dogs' facial expressions uh, from that perspective. But then again, if we live with dogs, we start... We, we won't ex observe just the facial expression. We will observe the entire dog. And we're often better off reading their body language than we are reading their facial expression. Even though I think that studies also show that the face is where we look first. Which behaviors in dogs uh, are maintained from interactions with other dogs uh, when they interact with humans? For instance, um, if... Uh, one is going like, to take a dog out on a walk and it's familiar with the sound of the leash coming off the, the hook or something like that. It's not uncommon for a dog to go into that long, full, um, uh, you know, front leg stretch that people call down dog, mm -hmm. you know, in yoga. So, mm -hmm. um, and some people will say that's a kind of remnant of the puppy play um, kind of stance. Again, people say this stuff. People are often self-appointed dog experts. This is kind of interesting. <laughs> like that. And the and I've learned this from researching it online that the, the various camps of of quote unquote dog experts mm -hmm. disagree vehemently with mm -hmm. each other. Mm -hmm. I mean oh, they, yeah. they write to me saying, you know, they're evil. This person <laughs> is cruel. That you know they they blame each other of animal yeah. cruelty yeah. for different training um mm. different training yeah. tools. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Yeah. But um dogs will do this uh down dog type mm -hmm. uh, movement, whatever it means with other dogs and they'll do it with humans. Mm -hmm. Do you think it means the same thing in those two different contexts? Most probably does. That play bow that you're describing is uh, what's referred to as a meta signal for play. So it's typically shown in a play context and I haven't seen it described, but then again, I'm not a dog owner, uh, so, but I haven't just seen it described in, in the context of let's go for a walk. But certainly in the play context, um, as far as I know, dogs play a bit differently with humans than they do with other dogs, but they do enjoy playing with humans. Uh, and and sometimes I think we humans have a hard time knowing whether what we're seeing is play or aggression, because there will be elements from the aggressive repertoire within a play bout. But typically what we can do then is look for what's referred to as MARS, M-A-R-S. So M being the meta signals, so those play bows. Or in other species, it will be other behaviors that are sort of indicating that I want to play. Uh, I know chimpanzees have like 30 or 50 different meta signals for play. Um, M-A, A is for activity shift. So we'll see different behaviors. They might be chasing, they might be pouncing, they might be wrestling, biting each other. Uh, but you'll see these activity shifts and it's not in the same order as it would be if they were truly fighting. Uh, M-A-R, R is for role reversals. So you'll see that the, the dog, uh, the dogs, if they're of different sizes or different um, sort of stamina or how big they are, or how um, competent fighters they are, would be that they'll take turns uh, winning and losing. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, because they, it's not fun playing if you lose all the time. So in order to keep playing, the bigger dog needs to lose sometimes. So they mm. they need to, in order to, to keep this interaction going, uh, that's the way to do that. And the last one, S, is self-handicap. So the larger dog will, will self-handicap themselves. You might see it, them doing a tug of war. And the large, large dog is just standing there and holding the thing. And the small dog is like pulling and, and really trying to get the thing. And the big dog is just standing there doing nothing. But then if a human takes over the toy and starts pulling, then the big dog will engage and start showing more of his strength and, and uh, escalate that behavior. It's a beautiful thing when you see animals adjusting their level of a kind of vigor in play yeah, yeah. so that the play can continue. Yeah. It's very sweet. I mean, it, it speaks to a bigger question, which is, uh, do dogs have empathy? Oh, I think so. Absolutely. I can't say I've I've seen any studies on it, but but just uh, yeah. I mean, I think I think so. Many uh, dog owners are familiar with when uh, we're grieving. Mm. Um, a dog will often come mm. closer mm. as opposed to moving further away. Um, I mean, I've seen some incredible 
moments. You know, we yeah. interpret these things, right? We anthropomorphize. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah. I, sure. I had someone in my home years ago who was was grieving a a, a death in her family, and uh, Costello came in and you know put a paw on her knee, and it's hard to not interpret that. Yeah. Um, as a, a meaningful moment yeah. of empathy. And who knows what he was experiencing. Maybe he was experiencing distress for all I know, but but it, the, the more uh, pleasant interpretation is that he wanted to extend comfort. I think it makes sense from the evolutionary perspective that social animals who live in a co cohesive social group uh, are good at reading each other's uh, emotional state and also uh, good at sort of trying to buffer negative emotions if if it's possible to do that. And so I, I would expect it with the any of the sort of more cognitively advanced species, I would expect some type of empathy.